Before giving the floor to our speaker, Holly McIntyre from Vanier College, please allow me to introduce her very briefly to you. Holly holds a Master of Education in Sustainability, Creativity and Innovation. She teaches physical education and nature-based education at Vanier College, Dawson, Cégep de Rivière-du-Loup and UCAM. And she's also been working to include sustainability and well-being education in all of her teaching. So I'll hand things over to Holly. Have a good webinar, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. Um, I am super pleased to be here. OK. Um, so, uh, Andy introduced me, so I won't bore you all with, uh, with those details again, um, but this, what I'm presenting to you is part of a, a project that um, I ran at Vanier College uh, for two years. It was uh, the result of an ECQ grant uh, that was a two-year project. At the time, they were doing two-year projects, which was nice, and the idea was to bring the idea of sustainable happiness to Vanier College. Um, so, I was supported through that grant to teach sustainable happiness to two different groups of staff and faculty uh, and as well to a group of students and also to have um, two, uh, three staff certified as sustainable happiness facilitators. So I'll be talking about what all of that stuff means um, in in the, the webinar. Um, just before we get started, there are some points in the webinar where I'm going to um, suggest some reflection questions for you. So if you want to have a pencil available to write with, that's great. I won't be asking you to share just in the interest of time. So if you don't want to write or you don't have a pen, then that's okay too. Uh, so here we go. Um, before we get started, the first thing I would like you to think about is think about a moment of happiness that you have experienced in your life. So it doesn't have to be like the most amazing moment, but a moment of, of happiness that you can identify. And just take a couple moments to think about some details or to write down some details that you remember about that moment. I'm just gonna be quiet for a couple of minutes. It's gonna be awkward for a bit. Go ahead and write. Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to think about some of the details of that happy moment. Um, if I can spur on some thought, um, what is it that made this moment happy for you? Was it the people that you were with? Was it a feeling of accomplishment that you experienced? What positive emotions were you experiencing in that happy moment? Perhaps you were experiencing feelings like awe, gratitude, challenge or excitement. Maybe you were in a natural environment. So this is one of the first things and activities that we do in the Sustainable Happiness Certificate. Um, and this certificate, I'll, I'll talk more about the details of it, but um, it really allows us to tap into uh, what real happiness is. Um, and this activity starts us off because um, we don't need to, I don't need to introduce to you, I don't need to teach you about what happiness is, right? We, we will try to define it a little bit, but you all know when you're happy, you all know what a happy moment is. Um, in the 
certificate when we teach this, when we do this activity with people, we get them to share their happy moment. And that's another amazing thing to see is when people start sharing their moments and you see the body language and you, you see me sharing my happy moment with you and it how it affects you to hear about my happy moment. So we don't need to define happiness necessarily to know what happiness is. And that's kind of what um, we, we, we developed that idea throughout the certificate. So what is sustainable happiness? I've mentioned it a few times now. It's about time we get a definition here. So happiness, uh, sustainable happiness is happiness that contributes to the well-being of an individual community or the planet without exploiting other people, the environment, or future generations. And this concept was developed by Dr. Catherine O'Brien, who um, was a prof at Cape Breton University. That's where I did my master's of education and I, I worked with Catherine. Um, so she's developed this concept of, of sustainable happiness after um, uh, learning about happiness research and positive psychology, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, and also thinking about the impact that we have on the environment and the importance of acting for sustainability. Uh, so sustainable happiness really means recognizing that we can increase our own happiness and well-being while being aware of the impact of our choices on others. So in fact, research shows that acting for the well-being of the planet is associated with high levels of well-being and happiness, according to the Happiness Research Institute. Um, and as we will see, sustainable happiness is interdisciplinary and is applicable in every sphere of our personal and professional lives. And it's being used to enhance curriculum, bridge gaps between college services and enhance the college environment and increase personal happiness and well-being both at home and at work. So one question we can ask ourselves is what really makes us happy versus what are we told makes us happy? What does society tell us makes us happy? Um, as an example of how to apply sustainable happiness, I would like you to imagine your coffee or your tea this morning. Um, if you didn't have a coffee or a tea, that's okay. We can still participate uh, as a thought experiment here. Uh, some of you might even have a coffee or tea with you right now. So are you aware of, of what that beverage is bringing to you? So uh, a traditional mindfulness practice would have us take in the process of making the coffee and then you look at it and you appreciate you know, the color and the texture and you appreciate the smell and the, the whole, the taste and the feel in your mouth and, and the ritual of having that coffee, right? So that would be a mindfulness practice of, of being in the present moment and appreciating what you have and, and appreciating every nuance of that, of that experience. Uh, and maybe that coffee is bringing you happiness uh, because of the ritual of starting your day. Maybe someone else is, is a part of that. Maybe you're sitting, uh, maybe not today, but sitting, uh, looking at a nice view or enjoying the sunshine. Um, so that morning coffee can really contribute to your day, right? Beyond just the caffeine hit that you'll get from it. But if we take it a step further and we think about sustainable happiness, We've already established that it's bringing you happiness or a certain amount of, of positive emotions and other, other uh, positive aspects. Um, but how does that coffee affect someone else's day? Uh, right, like it benefits my kids because I'm nicer to them after I've had my coffee. But um, how does it impact your grandchildren's day? How does it impact the day of someone halfway around the world? And does it? So what are some things you might want to know about your coffee? Um, one thing is, where did that coffee come from? Where were the beans grown? How were they grown? What impact did that have on the environment? Um, what impact did it have on the wildlife in the area? Uh, where did it come from, that coffee? How far did it have to travel? And what was the impact of that travel? Were there emissions, yes, um, associated with the transport of that coffee? How were ecosystems and wildlife impacted by the farming of those beans? Were they shade grown uh, and providing habitat for birds, uh, for example? What is the packaging? So then we get to the uh, coffee is here. How is it packaged? Is it packaged in a non-recyclable bag? Um, or is it packaged in a compostable bag? Or were you able to go and buy it in bulk and put it in your own container? 
okay, maybe you had a takeout coffee. Um, did you get a reuse? Did you have a reusable cup, or was it given to you in a disposable cup? What are those cups made of? Where will it go afterwards? What was the process involved? You can see that with each of these steps, we could have a whole nother web coming off of those of that step, right? What is the what is the material and how is it? disposed of, for example. And then what about the workers? Were they paid fairly for their product? What were the working conditions like? Okay, so this, this is a, a short example of we could spend all day um, dissecting this cup of coffee. But if I only focus on the happiness that it brings to me, then I don't necessarily worry about all those other things. But I could also make a choice to choose coffee that is shade grown, organic, fair trade in a container that's compostable, et cetera, right? So I can make choices that um, bring me happiness and that positively affect others and that positively even affect future generations um, and, the, and the natural world. Um, so that's an example of, of sustainable happiness and how my happiness, I don't have to sacrifice it in order to make a positive impact. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're exploring in the certificate and the coffee example is a good one because it, it, it covers a lot of the different topics that we talk about in sustainable happiness. Um, so sustainable happiness is based on the idea of positive psychology and sustainability and kind of the mix between the two and the idea that you can't truly be well if you are not concerned with the well-being of others and of the planet. Um, so the certificate itself was developed at Dawson College with Catherine O'Brien and Dawson, the Office of Sustainability, um, developed a 24-hour certificate that so to offer to staff so that they could improve their own professional and personal well-being. Um, the certificate helps uh, participants to recognize the elements that contribute to their happiness and well-being so that they can choose actions that will benefit them without compromise compromising the ability of others to live well too. Um, and this is what we brought to Vanier. So at Vanier, I was able to offer this twice to two different groups of staff, including faculty. Um, and uh, in, that, in those groups, we had teachers, we had advisors, we had folks from finance, we had the garden technician, we had the sustainability manager, we had the student life coordinator, we had the librarian, and teachers came from all kinds of different disciplines like early childhood education and humanities and science. Um, so a really wide range of participants. And then three staff members were subsequently certified as sustainable happiness uh, facilitators. So two teachers and the student life coordinator. Um, and these are the topics uh, you can see here that we cover. We start off with sustainability and positive psychology and well-being, and then we look at what kind of um, choices that we can make. So consumer choices um, and, ha and habits, um, nature connection choices, how do we choose to connect with nature, uh, why should we? Uh, we also look at the impact of mindfulness, gratitude, and appreciation. We look at how social justice is intertwined with sustainable happiness. And we're looking at uh, eco-anxiety and hope as well. So one of the first questions we ask uh, students to reflect on is what is the difference between well-being and happiness? Um, and really what we uh, get at is that not to spoil the punch, but they are interrelated, obviously. But um, we can talk about happiness uh, and well-being separately as well. So happiness, we often say, is an emotion that comes and goes, uh, while well-being is kind of more of an overall state. Um, and you can perhaps have overall well-being, and your happiness can fluctuate within that. Um, so we ask participants to reflect on if we can be happy without having high well-being. Um, can we have well-being and not be happy? Um, and we look at some of the research behind that, some, some of what has been studied, um, and we talk about different examples. Um, in, in, in the idea of trying to figure out, you know, are we meant to be happy all the time? What is the pursuit of happiness? And how does my pursuit of happiness affect you? And how does my pursuit of happiness affect the future of the planet and future generations? So um, just a bit of background on positive psychology. 
and well-being. Positive psychology is the study of conditions and processes that contribute to the flourishing or optimal functioning of individuals, groups, and institutions, as opposed to studying pathology, right? So psychology often, um, in general, traditionally has looked at pathology, uh, and positive psychology looks at it from the other perspective. What do we, what, what are the qualities of, and uh, conditions and processes that contribute to us being well? Um, so Martin Seligman is a pioneer and researcher in positive psychology and developed the idea of flourishing, wrote a book called Flourish, if you're interested, it's super interesting. Uh, flourishing is optimal well-being. So his model states that people who flourish experience positive emotions, like happiness. Uh, they experience engagement in what they're doing, so they feel engaged with, with what they're doing, either professionally, personally, at both. Uh, they have relationships that they maintain. Uh, relationships is, is a why it's a broad word, but we're talking about with people, we can talk about with the living world as well. Uh, people who flourish find meaning in what they do. Uh, they have opportunities for accomplishment. So they feel that they have accomplished and that they are able to accomplish things and uh, vitality is also an aspect of flourishing and vitality here refers to like physical health um, nutrition um, physical activity um, so being able to uh, yeah experience wellness physically in your body so well-being would include all of these things um, and then another model that we look at in a school context it comes from Patrick Carney who wrote about um, healthy schools and well-being in a school environment um, so he sees overall healthy schools as promoting health so physical fitness sleep nutrition spirituality relationships with others uh, including also resilience so that being the ability to resolve problems tolerance for adversity, recognizing opportunities, et cetera, and also flourishing, so as described by Seligman. So um, he puts flourishing as just one aspect of, um, of well-being in schools. And at the center of this model um, is relationships. So that indicates that relationships are part of all three elements, right? So relationships are part of health, part of flourishing, part of resilience as well, um, and the heart of, of this well-being model. So in the Sustainable Happiness course, we examine not only how we can promote well-being for our students, but also for ourselves. Um, and as a teacher or as a college employee, you know, do you experience engagement with your work? Do you find meaning in what you do? Do you experience accomplishment? Are you celebrated for your accomplishments? Um, people who are happy in their jobs have more than a great salary, right? I think everybody here probably knows that. We can also think about how we're enabling students to flourish. As teachers in my class, can I allow students to experience positive emotions? Can I make sure they're feeling, they're being engaged with the material? Can I encourage relationships in my class? So as a school staff, we have influence over you know the courses we teach and maybe if i'm not a teacher i can influence also their wider school experience so how can i uh, um, encourage students to be, be um, healthy physically at school how can i allow them to experience meaning in being at school every day um, so these are things that guide uh, me in my teaching now and um, are also a big part of understanding where happiness and well-being comes from so that we can further on uh, understand sustainable happiness. Uh, relationships are a huge part of this. Um, so uh, really focusing on encouraging relationships in class, encouraging relationships between um, staff and also uh, staff student, teacher student relationships. Um, so this is something that we focus on a lot in the Sustainable Happiness Certificate in, in CEGEPS, uh, is improving and, and increasing those relationships. Um, from what I've seen and from what we're hearing, students are needing more and more help in this area, particularly since the pandemic. So in first year CEGEPS, students need help. They don't know that many people maybe. They have their phone. Uh, it's easy to look at their phone and not interact with others. So, you know, for me, I've noticed 
I come into a class at the beginning, the first class of the semester, and everyone, all the students are sitting there, it's total silence, everyone is just looking at their phone instead of interacting. Uh, so this, this problem, you know, it leads to the students just going through their course without having relationships with the other students in their class. And I think as teachers, it's, it's important that we spend intentional time developing those relationships, even if it doesn't really have anything to do with our class. Um, so I have seen that focusing on relationships, and this is what I hear from other teachers as well, creates a positive environment, uh, contributes to student well-being. I have students creating new friendships with people in my classes and you know, getting together on the weekend with people that they just met in phys ed class. So students that you would never expect to hang out together to are um, spending time together and appreciating other, other perspectives when we intentionally put focus on those relationships in class. So investing in, that, in those relationships not only improves the classroom environment, but it provides an environment of trust too between me and the students, wherein the students feel safe to ask for help and that can have a positive impact as well on their results, uh, which leads to student success. Um, from a teacher-teacher perspective or a staff-staff perspective, for the employees who did the certificate, it was mentioned by many that they appreciated the opportunity to exchange with their colleagues, to spend this time with them in a context different from everyday work, and to really get a perspective of what it is those people do in their jobs every day. Um, so through that, we can develop more compassion for each other, more empathy, and we're able to understand school issues, what's happening in our SEJEP in a more holistic way, as opposed to only looking at it from my teacher perspective. Nature connection is a, a really important part of the certificate. So we address this topic and um, encourage participants to consider their natural affluence or the opportunities that they have to create a connection with nature. Uh, even if they're not able to travel you know, to a super remote wilderness area, we can still connect with nature on a daily basis. So we explore why nature is so important to our well-being. Uh, one of the guiding principles there being biophilia. So since we are a part of nature, we are really only whole when we have a connection with the natural world. So that's part of the theory of biophilia, which is about how and why we are naturally drawn to nature. So it helps to explain why being in nature decreases stress levels, increases recovery and promotes healing, and increases concentration and memory. It also helps to explain why we are drawn to natural shapes, colors, and textures. Um, for example, if we are designing a new classroom or student space or staff space, we can be thinking about that. So when we develop a connection with nature, we begin to appreciate it and understand it. And that's our bridge again to sustainability. So we wanna protect what we appreciate. We wanna protect what we know and love. So we can begin to make choices that will have less of a negative impact or more of a positive impact on nature. And then we can recognize also benefits, uh, opportunities to benefit from these, from these, uh, from these experiences. Uh, one question, I'm going to talk about the journal a little bit later, but we do use a journal in the in the program. One of the questions is this, what is the closest natural of body, body of water to you and what forms of life does it support? Um, so some, some interesting responses to this, a lot of students can be very disconnected from the natural environment. And here we are in Montreal, a lot of students are surprised to know that, you know, we're surrounded by uh, water and there's a river that flows on both sides of us and that river you know comes from one place and it all leads out to you folks in uh, it's the same water um, but uh, living in an urban environment we can become disconnected from that and disconnected then from the impact that our decisions have on the natural environment um, Mindfulness, gratitude, and appreciation is another aspect of uh, the certificate. So many of you might be familiar with mindfulness practice, gratitude practice. So these are practices that can be done anywhere, any time of day that enhances our experience of the present moment and allows us to consider what we really have and notice what we have. So noticing beauty and, and feelings of awe, noticing human acts of kindness, 
noticing your own reactions to events and the emotions that it brings up, those can all lead to feelings of happiness and well-being. So being mindful doesn't mean sitting cross-legged and clearing your mind of all thoughts. Mindfulness is really about noticing and being present. Students are experiencing anxiety at levels not seen previously. Um, and this anxiety stems from many sources, but eco-anxiety is one that is becoming more and more prevalent. Mindfulness is often used to treat anxiety as it centers us in the present moment rather than projecting into the future or worrying about things that we can't control from the past. And it also reminds us of what we need right now and what we already have. And from there, we can focus on gratitude and appreciation for what we do have. And it allows us to recognize the riches that we have rather than always feeling that we need something more. This is an example of a, of a reflection that I have students do at the end of every class that I teach uh, in phys ed. So I, it's based on the medicine wheel uh, from many indigenous cultures um, across North America. This is a, 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 a way of knowing a, a, a worldview of, the, of many indigenous cultures in North America that everything has many dimensions and health is one of those things that has many dimensions. So we get students, I get students to reflect on their physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional well-being or state of being after every class. Um, and this allows students to become more mindful of their experiences in phys ed class and what they are bringing to class, what is affecting them in class and what, how they're feeling in those different um, dimensions. Um, so through mindfulness, we can also see that everything is connected. And that's another main concept that we try to get across in the certificate. Um, so not only is your physical well-being connected to the other dimensions of well-being, but it's also connected to the environment that you live in. Your physical well-being is connected to the choices that you make, and it's connected to the choices that I make. So our well-being, my well-being is indissociable from the health of the ecosystems that support me. Um, and so in developing this awareness of interconnection, we are developing a sustainability mindset. Uh, another topic that we explore is what do what our consumption habits. So again, asking ourselves what makes me happy versus what I think makes me happy. And this is something that we can work on with students quite a bit because of their perceptions of what makes us happy. Uh, versus what research shows actually makes us happy. So we can look at these things from a well-being perspective as well as from a sustainability perspective. Um, generally guilting people into making choices is not effective, right? If I just say like, it's bad to consume um, all this fast fashion, it's just bad for the planet. Um, that doesn't really work very well to change people's behavior. But when we link the choices that we make to our well-being, then people tend to have a bit more personal investment in making those choices. Um, and those choices can be positive for us and for the planet. So for example, being aware of how shopping makes us feel versus how we expect it to make us feel. Um, fast fashion, technology, the food choices that we make all have a huge impact on our well-being and also on the planet. So how can we escape from the ever-present pressure to have the latest iPhone, to have the current fashionable clothing? What impact on the environment does it have if I eat less meat? What impact does it have on my health? So they all have quite a significant impact. Coming back to mindfulness, we can evaluate what the real impact of these habits are. So how do you actually feel after spending two hours scrolling on TikTok? And how, does, how long does the thrill of having that new phone last? And what is the real cost? of buying that cheap outfit. So not wanting to guilt folks, but wanting to make people really reflect and be mindful of it. So same goes for um, healthy, ethical, and sustainable food choices. What's good for us is also good for the planet. We can also encourage local economies. We can encourage fair trade and organic choices. Uh, the new food guide, the Canada Food Guide, which actually is not so new anymore. It's about six years old. Um, there's an emphasis on plant-based proteins and dairy products have been taken out of the food guide. So we can use that. I use that in phys ed to talk about not only health, but also uh, health for the planet. And eating less meat is one individual action that has been shown to have a big positive impact on the environment. So it is actually one of those individual actions that we can take to make an impact. 
So again, thinking about how I can make choices that are good for me without making a sacrifice that are also good for others and for the planet and for future generations. So can sustainable happiness, can sustainable actions influence our happiness? Yes, they can. So in as opposed to thinking about these things as sacrifices, it has been shown that taking action, positive action for sustainability um, increases our happiness and increases our feelings of well-being. <clears throat> Um, so why is that? So often choices that are sustainable and good for the planet, good for others and good for future generations are also good for us. So if you take, for example, active transport, it's shown that people who commute actively, either walking or cycling, tend to enjoy their commute more and arrive at their destination happier. Um, so for many, many different reasons, but that's been shown. So it's not so much a sacrifice like oh like i'm sacrificing myself by taking my bike to work no like it's actually good for me and it's good for my environment um so we like to explore some of those um ideas as well that the choices you make it doesn't have to be a sacrifice in order for it to be good for the environment um a lot of what we're talking about in the program um, ha has tied into the idea of living campus. So living campus was developed at Dawson um, and has expanded into the idea of living schools in other um, school settings. Um, the living campus sees the campus as a living laboratory. So all aspects of the campus become an opportunity for learning. The campus is interconnected with local, the local global and natural communities. And all employees and students are involved in, in, in learning and co-learning and in contributing to that campus with a perspective of well-being for all. Um, so examples of things that are happening on Living Campus at Dawson and also a lot of stuff is happening at Vanier as well um, are things like uh, beehives on the roof, um, garden, a lot big gardening initiatives, food production, um, supporting local ecosystems like insects and birds that are using those those natural spaces um, and then using those spaces to also teach uh, all kinds of disciplines you know like I would challenge teachers to think of a discipline that cannot be taught um, in this living lab uh, scenario you know for example at Vanier there's been history biology physics and all kinds of other topics taught through the gardens um, and that's a that's an example of how sustainable happiness can be brought into teaching and into school systems is through this idea of campus as a living lab and supporting natural um, uh, environments around the campus and thinking about the campus in a sustainable way. So how do we improve that? How do we lessen our impact as a campus on the planet? If you want to know more about Living Campus and the concept, it, the Dawson website has a lot of information on it about that. Um, and it's super interesting to, to go through and, and very inspiring. Uh, a brief discussion and introduction to the sustainable development goals, which do form a, sort of a basis for the sustainability piece of the sustainable happiness certificate so the sustainable happiness uh, the sustainable development goals are developed by the united nations there's 17 goals that we are trying we that we uh, everyone the world uh, governments primarily are trying to achieve by 2030. Um, so these are the goals you can find out lots more information on the sdg website um, but um what this does is, you know, in the past sustainability, we often talked about sustainable development and we talked about three pillars, you know, economic, social and environmental pillars of sustainable development. Um, this, these 17 sustainable development goals recognize that um, sustainability involves many, 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 many different aspects and not just those famous three pillars. So, so you know, for example, gender equality as part of sustainability. Um, example, sustainable cities and communities. Example, uh, affordable and clean energy, zero hunger. So if we recognize how all of these are connected to sustainability, um, then we can also link sustainability to everything we do 
as teachers and as CEGEP employees. In all disciplines, in all departments, in all services, we can think about our impact on sustainability. So <clears throat> recognizing that working for the good of the planet and working for the good of all of its inhabitants contributes back to my well-being. So we can't separate our well-being from that of the planet, from all other living beings or from future generations. And we can connect that to all subjects studied at CEGEP. So an example is um, a phys ed course called Eco Landscaping that had students uh, build a water retention system that would filter the copper coming off of the copper roof uh, before it goes back into the St. Lawrence River, this water would drain into a wetland. And the students actually built this wetland as part of their phys ed course. Uh, so physically, they were moving lots of material uh, and building, working together and learning how to do that safely uh, for their bodies. But they were also um, building this, this, this wetland that would then filter the water before it goes into the St. Lawrence. So they were learning about good health and well-being through their physical activity. They were getting a quality education. There were girls and boys, women and men, all working together and doing the same things. They were focusing on clean water. Uh, they were focusing on a city and community being sustainable. They were uh, thinking about responsible consumption and production. They were caring about life on land uh, by building this wetland, building ecosystems for insects and possibly even amphibians. They were contributing to the infrastructure of their college. They were taking action for climate. They were also contributing to life below water. So really like this um, project is an example of how we can create amazing pedagogical opportunities for students while contributing to the good of the planet um, and the good of students. And so that brings me to talking about students and mental health. Um, you know, regardless of your discipline, regardless of what you do at CEGEP, we know that the mental health of students is worrisome. Uh, according to a recent study, 66.5% of Canadian college students report a decline in their mental health since starting college. Um, and one of those, like I mentioned earlier, one of those sources of, of, of difficulty is the idea of eco-anxiety. So eco-anxiety is uh, feelings of anxiety or dread uh, related to the ecological crisis and the future of the planet. And this is rising among young people. Um, in a national survey of 16 to 25 year olds, 56% of students of 16 to 25 year olds, excuse me, reported feeling sad, afraid, anxious, and powerless. And 37% said that eco-anxiety negatively affects their daily functioning. So that was a 2023 study um, in the Journal of Climate Change and Health. Um, that was in Canada, a study in Canada. Um, so it's a definitely an important issue, even if it seems like students aren't taking action for the environment. Uh, sometimes that's because of paralysis, feeling really like, I don't know what to do, and maybe it's hopeless anyways, right? Um, the Vanier College Strategic Plan and many other college strat plans are prioritizing student well-being and success as well as prioritizing sustainability. So sustainable happiness is something that really ties those two things together. It's a lens through which we can help students um, look to show them that their happiness comes from things that might be available to them already. So relationships, nature, mindfulness, exercise, finding meaning, et cetera. That's what brings us happiness. Um, in addition to that, participating in action projects like the eco landscaping course that I just described, Taking action is a recognized way to reduce feelings of eco-anxiety by realizing that we have agency and that we can make change. Uh, reconnecting with nature is another proven way to decrease stress and improve health. So all of these things uh, kind of tie together to um, help with the student mental health crisis. Um, for teachers, it's really important to note that 
uh, your health and well-being is super important as well. So teacher well-being is also positively affected by these concept of sustainable happiness and outdoor teaching in particular has been shown to decrease stress, uh, to improve health because you're in a better uh, air quality environment, uh, to reduce the noise, to find meaning in teaching by applying your um, by, by linking your curriculum with actual things in the world. It improves relationships with students and colleagues to teach outside as well. It allows you to have a connection with nature. And for many of us, it provides a coherence between our thoughts and actions and our teaching. So finding that meaning, finding that engagement in what you're doing. Uh, so it's good for everyone, it's win-win. <laughs> um, the journal, I have ref I've made reference to the journal a couple times. So the Sustainable Happiness Semester Journal, it's always hard to show things with the blurred screen, but here I'm holding it up. That's what it looks like. Um, this is a 100 page journal designed for students. Uh, on each page is a question for reflection. So you've seen some of those questions um, as we've gone through the, the webinar today. Um, and we use that to support the certificate. So as a basis for discussion. Um, this journal can be ordered, like you can order a copy of it um, from the Sustainable Happiness website. So actually I can put that in the chat if you're interested. Um, I'll put it in now. Um, it's available in both English and French. So not to like plug it, but I just wanted to let you know that that, that exists. And the next slide I wanted to show you um, is uh, a couple of teachers who are talking about how they've used the journal in their classes. So their classes are research uh, methods and another class in science. Um, this is uh, the two teachers are from Vanier. I'm going to just skip the introductions. Actually, the introductions aren't that long. I'll play them. Um, so this is uh, this is the introductions. And I teach history and research methods courses, and I've used the journals in both kinds of courses. My name is Stéphane Bourget, I'm uh, teaching physics um, and I'm using uh, the journal in a course on sustainability which is called Design for a Sustainable Future. So that's, uh, these two teachers have used the journals in their classes. Something they got to know each other, they got more comfortable. And the students always expressed to me too that they enjoyed thinking about these kinds of issues. That there was something for them to begin personally from thinking about, you know, their goals in life and what what their priorities are and so on. So it was kind of personal growth plus they were making friends and it led to a good atmosphere between me and the students because I would always share with them what my thoughts were on the questions after hearing their thoughts. So they got to know me better yeah. as well. Yeah. So it was like a very nice team building thing. I felt that the classes became more cohesive. Oh, cool. Cool. A whole lot of work to, 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 to do to actually help students you know, get uh, into more positive emotions toward the future. Uh, but I think it did help. Um, in the first, uh, like in the fall semester, it was not so obvious at first because students were less, um, less uh, well, they shared less in class. They were more reserved and, and uh, uh, but but in the feedback that I got toward the end of the class, uh, actually it popped up in in the comments that actually they appreciated the uh, the journal, um, and um, for pretty much all, all students that uh, responded except one uh, that uh, took, were more interested by grades than by by uh, you know, the uh, the uh, benefits of doing the journal, but mm -hmm. otherwise it was a positive very positive feedback. Okay. And in this, this semester, actually, students were more uh, participative and share more uh, in class, uh, you know, willingly uh, about you know, what they wrote. Uh, so we had uh, uh, you know, more, uh, more live discussions. But I, in research methods, it helped some of my students choose their topics, because some things resonated in the journals with them. So, you know, I had a student who uh, decided to do a study on giving compliments and 
how it affects people to give and to receive compliments and they interviewed a bunch of people about it and mm. you know it was pretty interesting what he found out and somebody else decided to write about like how having pets enhances people's happiness and they also did interviews with pet owners you know and so on so it, it kind of sparked an interest in a topic and then as they were reflecting about happiness issues yeah sometimes it can so um, I don't want to take up too, too much time in, in the rest of the, the video, Silky talks about um, making connections with course material. So um, historical perspectives on happiness in their history, in her history class. Um, so creating a personal connection to that material. And then also they both felt good about providing this opportunity for students. So less stress about, they felt less stress about not covering material, um, especially after COVID, they felt uh, that it was important to really focus on student well-being, And they were able to do that through using the journal as, a, as an addition to their classes. Um, so that uh, that was just a little snapshot of what so some of the teachers, oops, excuse, excuse me, what some of the teachers who have taken the Sustainable Happiness Certificate have done, uh, how they've been applying that. Something they got. Um, so I'm gonna skip over this and just um, ask you now if you have any questions. Thank you so much for uh, sharing these inspiring practices, Holly, for uh, the theoretical underpinnings, but also some uh, great examples. So uh, right now we don't have any questions yet in the Q&A. Um, so maybe uh, if anyone has a question, now is a good time to uh, ask it either in the chat or in the Q&A while uh, we wrap things up. I am just going to share in the chat uh, the link to the appreciation survey. You'll also receive it by email, uh, as well as a couple of reminders about our upcoming webinar, um, Pedagogie Collegia, which is now available in English as well. And uh, of course, registration for the annual symposium, um, which is open as of now. So I haven't received any other uh, questions, uh, Holly. So I think you, you uh, did a great job in uh, explaining all of these principles. Um, I am sure that um, participants can also easily get a hold of you should they think of something else. So with your permission, in the email that will be sent out, I will also share your, your contact details. So if anyone has any questions, they can reach out to you. Yeah, absolutely, in English or French. Wonderful. So thanks again very much, Holly, for uh, presenting today. And thank you to all participants for being here with us. Have a nice day, everybody. Bye. Thank you.